we're going to pick up today um, in topic five, basically where we left off. Before we get there, I want to give you some lab tips. So um, I'm not going to talk about the introduction of the lab report. Uh, hopefully that's straightforward. Um, follow the instructions in the handout. Basically, the introduction is background information, objectives, and uh, your hypothesis. It's going to be about a page, page and a half. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the results section. Um, this is something that was asked for you in your pre-lab um, assignment. So it's going to include two parts. Your results section is going to include your data. And uh, probably you're more familiar with your graphs. And uh, we've talked a little bit about graphs already in that video I gave you. And that's going to have, you're going to have three graphs, basically your standard curve, figure one, your uh, temperature experiment, figure two, and your uh, solvent experiment, uh, figure three. The other part of the results is a written component, right? So uh, you can think of your whole report as, uh, you know, a little bit of a kind of a complex kind of essay, right? You have your introduction, which introduces things, your methods, which I'll talk about next day. Um, and uh, you're going to have your, um, your results and you're, you're telling the reader about it. And so the graphs are where the reader is going to go to when they want more information, right? That shows all the data in one place. Um, the written part uh, basically says the trends. So you're going to refer to each of those graphs. In figure one, this is what we saw. In figure two, this is what we saw. In figure three, this is what we saw. So you're going to give a, just a very quick description and uh, basically mention the trend. So I don't want you to go through and talk about this is what happened at minus 20. This is what happened at minus five. This is what happened at, you know, and, and so on and so on. We don't, we don't need you to list everything that's going on. But the trend is what's important. What happens with the temperature? Do, um, you know, does the membrane damage increase with increasing temperature? Like, well, what are the trends? And that's what we're really looking at here. Um, so notice the results section does not include your rough data, right? So your tables are going to be included in your appendix. Uh, so basically a photocopy or a scan or whatever, um, it's just included so that if something is wonky with the rest of your report, I'm gonna go look at your rough data and see what's going on. And you're not gonna discuss and interpret Right, the discussion is for the discussion section. And we'll talk about that uh, at some point too. Um, so let me just give you a couple of examples here about what the written component might look like. Okay, so as I mentioned, you're gonna talk about the, um, the trends, right? And, uh, but you do wanna be specific enough, right? So you can see, for example, uh, there's two sentences there, right? First sentence says, it was found that the most extreme temperatures caused the largest amount of beta cyanide leakage. The minus 20 treatment resulted in 16 micromolar of leakage and the 85 resulted in 10.5 micromolar leakage. And then you can see we have figure two there. The other one says the highest temperature and the lowest temperature gave the highest absorbance value demonstrating that extreme temperature damage membranes the most. So here's another case where I'm hoping it's quite obvious which one of these is better. Right, I mean, take a look at that top one. It's specific. It's telling me exactly which temperatures, minus 20, 85, and then exactly how extreme the damage was telling me how much leakage we see. Leakage of what? It's telling the name of the pigment. Um, and it's also telling me if I want to uh, look at more data in particular, I'm gonna go over there to figure two. So that, that sentence there is really crammed with information. And you don't have to make it so crammed, you can, that could probably be easily broken out into three sentences, but you wanna be specific enough without, uh, like I said, giving me all the information, but kind of the highlights. So that's what you wanna do in your written component. So the written component is gonna be like, um, you could do one paragraph or you could do uh, you know, one paragraph per graph. It kind of depends on how you wanna discuss it. Um, but for most people, it's gonna be about half of the page. Like I said, the other thing about the uh, results is the graphs. So do take a look at that video that I sent out last week on how to do the graphs. Okay, so back to topic four. Topic four, we were looking at yeah, different components or parts or uh, body parts of a bacterium. And uh, here's our little diagram. I think, let's see here, we talked about ribosomes, we talked about chromosomes, we talked about plasmids, the cytoplasm, the membrane, the cell wall. We haven't talked about everything else yet. You can see a lot of those other things we have not talked about are surface features on our bacterium. So let's get into that. And don't forget, we're also making uh, some notes 
on my virtual whiteboard, which is my Word document. And so I will come back to that document as we, as we go through all of these uh, different uh, features of the bacterial cell. So the first feature to mention is this here. Um, this is the fimbriae or pili. So I apologize, the, uh, the names of these things are not the best names. Fimbriae, that's kind of like people threw a bunch of letters together and saw what stuck. I don't like the word. I don't know what the origin of the word is, uh, but I really don't like it. But both of these words are used relatively interchangeably. So you kind of need to know both of them. I like pili better um, because pili starts with a P and um, so do proteins. And so these structures are made out of proteins, right? So that's what's helping me to remember what they are. And these structures are, allow, are used for sticking to things. So if you take a look at this, um, this image here on the left, you got all these little, um, almost look like hairs, uh, but you can think of them more like sticky hairs. And so this bacterium is trying to attach to things, right? Maybe it lives in the environment and it's trying to attach to a rock in a lake. Um, maybe this is a pathogenic organism and it's trying to attach to somebody's body system. Uh, but that's what they do. They need to attach sometimes in the, uh, uh, in the environment to something else. I'll talk about the sex pili in a minute, but I want to show you some other, um, other diagrams. This one's really nice. Uh, electron micrograph, it looks like E. coli there is, um, is dividing as well. So very, very uh, uh, cool image that they made there. So you may have noticed this other type of pili here. Uh, there is one specialized type of pili called a sex pilus. So pilus is one, by the way. Pilus is singular. And pili is many. So if you hear me uh, flip back and forth between those two words, that's what's going on. So a sex pili is also an attachment device, but it has a special function, which is bacterial sex. So let's talk about that. It's kind of interesting. Um, here's a, um, an electron micrograph image. And uh, what you are witnessing here is, uh, is two bacterial cells caught in the act. That's right, they are having bacterial sex. Uh, bacterial sex is also called conjugation. And in this case, when we're talking about sex, we are talking, uh, not talking about reproduction. Um, in this case here, by sex or conjugation, so sex basically means DNA exchange in this particular case. And that's usually what the case is for other types of sex in the biological world. Um, not necessarily. I mean, the word clearly has a lot of definitions. Um, and so if you take a look at this, we have this, uh, this uh, pillus, and this one is a lot longer uh, and more durable than your typical pillows. And uh, there's the diagram there. So I got a little kind of scheme that shows what's going on here. So first of all, you have one cell that is um, F plus. So you can see F plus here. And uh, F plus, this is just a geneticist that is using code. So F stands for fertile. Uh, I guess you could think of it as, as other F words as well, but let's not, let's not go there. Um, so that F plus cell, plus means it has a gene. It has a gene, um, it actually has a whole plasmid called the F plasmid, which is shown over here on the left. So that F plasmid actually has the genes for making the sex pillus. So you can see what happens, it makes the sex pillus, and it's... Um, I guess a little bit like a grappling hook. Uh, it's reaching out and it's just attaching to another bacterial cell out in the environment. And they don't actually have to be the same species. So basically at that stage, what they do is um, it pulls the other cell together. And uh, so like I said, kind of interesting um, um, activity here. Uh, and, uh, and what happens is um, you probably know that DNA is double-stranded. So it actually unspools in one strand. Uh, we think it goes through the pillus. We're not entirely sure, but we think it goes in the middle of the pillus, kind of like a little straw. And, uh, and now what you have is uh, basically two cells that have that plasmid. So now both cells are F plus or fertile cells. And so now the recipient cell can go and do the same thing with another cell. And, and so what's the big deal here? Um, sharing a little bit of DNA. Well, this is a huge deal in the medical community because the concern is 
that those plasmids have genes for drug resistance, antibiotic resistance. And that's actually one of the big concerns about, um, about this kind of uh, uh, activity that some bacterial cells can, can undergo. And they don't even have to be the same species. That's kind of the scary thing here is uh, genes for drug resistance can be spread uh, between different uh, species in some cases. So there's a, um, a very recent study showing the, um, the sex pillows being stretched out. It's kind of an interesting little fluorescence uh, um, uh, micrograph or video, I guess you'd call it. Okay, I'm gonna go back to this um, bacterial structure, these notes I was making. Uh, so there's all the notes that we made last day. You can see the cytoplasm, ribosomes, enzymes, nucleoid, plasmids, cell wall. So let's, um, let's just make a note here on fimbriae and pili. So composition is they're made out of proteins. So I told you, remember that they're made out of proteins because uh, um, P starts with, or pili starts with P and protein starts with P. So I'm hoping that helps you out a little bit. Um, okay, so what are the structures? So our function, we, um, maybe I'll, I'll describe them a little bit. Um, they're hair-like projections. Projections. And that are for sticking to surfaces. And we will just mention in particular, the sex pillus is for bacterial conjugation. Remember conjugation is DNA exchange or bacterial sex. Okay. All right, hopefully if you got that, if not, don't worry, we will come back to that in a moment. Okay, so fimbriae pili, that's what these things are. Uh, let's talk about something else that's also a projection on bacteria. We're gonna talk about bacterial motility. Um, so motility basically means swimming or movement, right? And you can see there, there's some, uh, some E. coli swimming around like crazy. So these things can move. Not all of them can swim, but uh, many of them can. They are capable of motility. And they do this with a, a, a feature called a flagella. Actually, flagella is plural. Flagellum is one. And uh, so there's a, there's a cartoon that shows the bacterial flagellum. And uh, if you take a look carefully, this is actually a gram-negative cell wall. It's got two membranes and a little bit of peptidoglycan in the middle. And so the flagellum uh, penetrates the cell wall and sticks out, kind of like a little tail. And uh, notice my note here, it says it rotates like a propeller. So it's kind of like this, right? Um, and that's kind of important. Uh, something we're gonna talk about a little bit after the midterm as well, is we're gonna talk a little bit about the energy source for this whole thing. Um, but it's kind of a unique structure for uh, something that they see in the biological world, something that rotates like this. This is really basically a very, very, very tiny molecular motor that can do this kind of thing. So pretty cool. I'll show you some more pictures. Um, the one note I wanted to say is that it's actually very different uh, from a eukaryotic flagellum. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about those in topic seven, which is the first topic after the midterm. Um, so they have the same name, uh, but the eukaryotic flagellum is, is a very different structure. Uh, it's much larger, has a different power source. It doesn't rotate, it flip flops back and forth like a whip. So more on that later. So there's, um, there's some pictures of some flagella. Um, there's different varieties and arrangements. Some organisms have one, some of them have many, uh, and um, you know some organisms have none, right? Uh, they're very, very tiny, skinny structures. Usually you need special stains, uh, sort of thick stains, I guess you could call them, that make them, make them visible. Uh, and there's, there's a few right there. Uh, here's some videos for you. Uh, you can see this first one. You can see is a very cool kind of fluorescence microscopy, and you can actually see the uh, flagella um, uh, kind of moving and twisting around. There's the E. coli one I showed you before. The one on the bottom is some tethered uh, organisms, so that means they're attached to the slide and they can't escape. But you can see that the, it's causing the whole organism to kind of spin around, and uh, you can see the motion of these things. So, a, a pretty cool video. So one more kind of sort of side note about flagella is um, there are these things called endoflagella. And uh, so these endo, endo means in, 
Um, these flagella are actually in the periplasm between the two membranes in these gram-negative organisms. And rather than the flagellum uh, spinning around, the entire organism is going to corkscrew through the environment. And so you can see these little corkscrew organisms. This one here, by the way, is the one that causes uh, Lyme disease. You may have heard of Lyme disease. It's spread by ticks and uh, it's spreading across Canada. All right, so a couple of F words, fimbriae or pili and flagellum. So you can see the size difference too. The flagella are, are much, much larger than the fimbriae. So I see somebody has a question here and uh, about the flagellum. They basically allow these things to swim around. So I'm gonna put a note on that here uh, in my note box here. So flagella are also made out of proteins. And the function is for motility, which is basically swimming. Okay, so more structures. Um, I know there's a lot here, but we're actually kind of near the end. You can see there's only about maybe three more things here to talk about. And uh, they're all important for bacteria and they're actually all important for um, um, some of the pathogenesis. So if you end up getting into medicine or something like that, a lot of these structures are important for those reasons. All right, so we got these, um, these sticky fimbriae or pili, which are for attaching to things. We have the flagella that are used for swimming. And um, those are all proteins. So now what I want to talk about is something that are not proteins. We're going to talk about these things called glycocalyx. So glyco, if you remember, means carbohydrate or sugar. And calyx means coat or layer. So a glycocalyx is really a sugar coat. Now, this is not a sweet coat. Um, this is a sticky carbohydrate. And there's actually two kinds. Um, that you see in the literature. They're called capsules and slime layers. Now there's not a lot of difference between capsules and slime layers. Capsules tend to be more neatly organized. Uh, slime layers tend to be slimier or goopier. Um, but if you discover the organism, you get to name it, right? So sometimes you have one thing in an organism that would be considered a capsule and someone else will call it a slime layer, so on and so on. So they're used kind of interchangeably. Now these carbohydrates, they can absorb a lot of moisture and like I said, get really sticky. And that's kind of one of the main things that they do is it helps them to stick to surfaces. I have a picture here of a, of a bacterial cell that's, uh, that's stuck to a tonsil cell. So this one here is uh, a streptococcus. So this is the organism that might give you strep throat, right? And uh, of course it cannot attach to your tonsils without the uh, capsule. And uh, so like I said, it's kind of a sticky surface. Now, the other thing that it can do is actually um, because it's kind of slimy, your immune cells have a hard time grabbing onto it. So it actually helps evade the immune response as well. So I think I've got another um, picture there. I thought I had another picture. There we go. Um, maybe I don't. I thought I had another picture. Uh, back to our notes here. So glycocalyx. Uh, let me see here. What I'm going to do is just put that all onto one, the next slide here. So glycocalyx are made of the carbohydrates. Okay, and um, they are for sticking to surfaces. Also for evading the immune, evading immune cells. So they help protect them against our immune system and allow them to unfortunately cause disease in many cases. All right, so back to the PowerPoint here. Um, I'm gonna talk just a minute about biofilms, but I will not ask you about biofilms on the test. But I just wanna mention that there's a lot of um, organisms that, uh, that secrete stuff. Um, they can secrete carbohydrates, they can secrete glycoproteins, they can secrete all sorts of goo. And often uh, we call this a biofilm. And you've got a bunch of organisms like this that live in a whole bunch of goo. Um, some of these organisms, this is often what you see out in the environment. If you're um, ever in a lake and you're swimming and you step on a slimy rock, that's a biofilm, right? Uh, there's a lot of biofilms that are found um, in our, on our bodies. So if you've ever had plaque on your teeth, um, these are, there's bacteria living in, the, in that plaque and that's a biofilm. 
And of course, um, you know, this is important that we brush our teeth. And if you don't, they can, they can start to cause cavities and things like that. Uh, and this is why you should brush your teeth. Uh, mouth wash is not good enough. You should, you need to, you need to actually do a little bit of scrubbing to get off those bacteria and flossing as well. Uh, like I said, I'm not gonna, not gonna talk about um, biofilms any more than that. Um, maybe I'll make a note on it when we get back, back to there. Uh, so just a quick review um, of these bacterial structures, and there's actually one more that's not on here that we're, we're going to talk about. But uh, so number one is the DNA or the chromosome. Number two are the are uh, as a pilus or pili for sticking to surfaces. Number three, that's supposed to be your ribosomes, those little dots there. They're for making proteins. Number four is a flagellum, and that's for swimming. Now, number five, six, and seven, it's a little hard to maybe tell what you're looking at, uh, but um, um, if you, if you kind of, I'll, I'll show you all three here. Uh, the innermost layer is the cell membrane, and that's followed by the cell wall, so that's the peptidoglycan. So maybe I'll put that down, cell wall peptidoglycan. And then the capsular slime layer, um, that's that's actually found exterior to that, and that's going to be more goopy, but it's kind of hard to draw something that's goopy, unfortunately. Uh, number eight is the cytoplasm, and number nine is an extra piece of DNA, and that is a plasmid. Okay, so um, the last structure I want to talk about is something called an endospore. Um, so what is an endospore? This, this is a, a structure that's formed in some bacteria. Uh, gram positives only, uh, that uh, it, it's, it's uh, encountering some bad conditions. So maybe the things are drying up or there's no nutrients. And so what it does is it protects itself by forming a little dormant sort of structure that's, it's kind of like sleeping. It's kind of like a seed, right? So what it does, and uh, I'll show you here in a second, I got a slide that shows the formation of endospore, but it basically takes its DNA and wraps it up and protects it until uh, nutrients or water or whatever it is returns another day. There's some uh, images of some endospores. You can see the kind of, uh, you know, these little uh, dots here at the end. These ones look like little tennis rackets. The one on the left are, are stained in a blue color. Um, I have a, a better picture here of the, uh, of the endospore and the coat is, is uh, a, big, a big, big thick layer of, um, of peptidoglycan. Uh, endospores were uh, something that came out as being important uh, back in 2001 there were some terrorist attacks where somebody was mailing um, endospore, uh, endospores of anthrax in the mail. So if you're interested in that, you can, you can read up on it, but uh, not good at all. Um, this kind of shows you how an endospore is formed. So there's your cell. And what your cell is, it starts to divide, but it doesn't do a normal kind of division. What it does is an asymmetric division. And so what it's going to do is protect one copy of its DNA by basically forming a really thick layer of peptidoglycan. So there it is, that, uh, that coat or cortex is called, uh, is what it's called. And uh, sometimes the endospore uh, gets separated from the rest of the, the husk of the cell. And you can see there's our free endospore over there. Uh, sometimes it doesn't, it kind of just depends on the, on the organism. So these things are extremely dormant. Uh, they can last a long, long time. And this is one of these things where uh, it's getting kind of interesting in terms of how long endospores can survive. Uh, definitely some endospores have survived longer than 50 years. Um, some of Louis Pasteur's work, uh, 67 years after his death, they dug up a box of some of his stuff and they revived endospores from it. Um, we have been able to apparently revive endospores from the guts of Egyptian mummies. Um, ice core samples, and even from uh, insects in amber. Uh, now, these last two are a little bit more controversial because there's a lot of people who believe that DNA cannot survive that long uh, and that maybe the uh, scientists contaminated their samples, um, but it's certainly plausible. And uh, I'm not really familiar with all the research on it, but uh, um, there is a good argument to be made that what they did was in fact uh, legitimate. Um, but uh, again, not an area that I'm familiar with, but they can definitely last for decades. They're very, very dormant, tough structures. All right, time for a note on endospore. So biofilm, um, I'll put a quick note on this. So biofilms are made out of carbohydrates. They're kind of like glycocalyxes. 
and uh, they're made of the glycoproteins. And these are, um, these are secretions that help bacteria to stick and live on surfaces. So like I said, kind of similar to glycocalyx, but a little bit more complex. You can think of the biofilm as a little bit more like, uh, um, uh, you know, it's not so close to the bacteria. It's forming a big sort of goopy layer. So endospores are a peptidoglycan coat, peptidoglycan coat. And these are dormant, tough structures and uh, formed when the organism has few nutrients and resources, we'll say. Well, we'll just say few nutrients. And that's it, that's the end of all these structures. So a few new words for you to learn, okay? And so, um, you know, the midterm is coming up. I'm gonna talk about the midterm a bit more on Friday, but it's really, really important that you, that you review the vocabulary for every unit. There's a lot of new words, a lot of words probably many people have not seen before. And uh, being able to tackle these kind of tests is, is uh, really, um, the ability, requires the ability to understand the words of the course. Okay, we're not done talking about bacteria. There's quite a bit we could say about bacteria um, in general. And so I'm gonna to touch on a few things. One is they come in many shapes and sizes and uh, we're gonna get a chance to uh, use these words in the lab, lab four, so that's next week. So one of the words we used already was caucus or cocci, that means spherical. Uh, a rod shaped cell, so bacillus kind of like this is a rod shape. And then some cells kind of have a bit of a corkscrew to them. We call these spirilli or spirillums. Some of them aren't quite so obvious. Some are a little bit more like that. Um, and uh, I, we have one species that we're going to look at that should be a, have a little bit of a spiral shape in the lab. So we'll get a chance to, um, to use those words in the lab. Sometimes they are arranged. Uh, so sometimes we end up with diplos. So diplo means two. So you could have something like that, which is a diplococcus. Uh, we can have clusters like staphylo, and so a cluster kind of looks like a bunch of uh, grapes, maybe, so maybe something like that. So we could have a staphylococcus, and we can have a uh, chain. So we can have, for example, streptococcus, things like this. And streptococcus, of course, is uh, there's one of the organisms that cause uh, strep throat, um, um, a throat infection. So all those terms we're gonna get a chance to use in the lab. These are the ones that you need to know. And uh, you'll probably need to know them for the lab exam too. So a little uh, heads up on that. Uh, so a little bit more about some of these organisms. We could spend a lot of time talking about a lot of these organisms. I just wanna kind of highlight a few and talk a little bit about E. coli and a few other things. Um, there's a whole bunch of different bacteria, bacterial species out there, um, probably up to 4 million. Uh, one of the biggest groups here is this one here, which is the proteobacteria. So these are all gram negatives, by the way. And uh, for example, uh, you can see uh, where I thought we had E. coli here somewhere. I guess we don't. Uh, I'm trying to remember which group E. coli actually belongs in. Um, I thought it was alpha or beta. I just can't remember which one. Um, but, uh, and, and don't worry about the names of these. We're not, I'm not going to be asking you about Helicobacter or Nitrozomonas or anything like that. But uh, this is a huge group of, of bacterial organisms. Um, there's some other groups here. You can see there's the gram positives right here. So this would include like uh, uh, Streptococcus, for example. Uh, there's chlamydias, that's a sexually transmitted disease. Spirochetes, that includes Lyme disease and so on. So thousands of species, some of them are medically relevant, some of them are relevant for other areas of biology and ecology. So what is relevant uh, is I want to talk a little bit about E. coli. Okay, we are going to be growing E. coli in the lab for lab four. Uh, e. coli stands for Escherichia coli. So that was named after um, a guy. His name was Theodore Escherich. And um, coli is because it's found in the colon. So that's where that name came from. Um, and you can see that it's mostly harmless. And uh, there's some more, more images of, uh, 
of E. coli. Some are not so harmless, but there's a lot of different strains of E. coli, and that's something I want to talk about a little bit here. I think I've got a slide coming up on that. This is often what a lot of people think of when they think of E. coli. They're thinking about uh, contaminated uh, romaine lettuce or uh, a hamburger meat recall, or um, you hear about E. coli in the news, and it always seems to be bad news. Um, but it's not. This is only like just a few strains of E. coli causing bad news. And, and so, um, you know, this is, this is how I think of E. coli. Um, e. coli is uh, a huge, important part of my research. Uh, it's an organism that is, that is uh, good for you for the most, for most of the time. Um, so this is something I want to talk about a little bit. So what is E. coli? It's an organism that lives in your intestine. Uh, and um, if you are warm-blooded, uh, you have E. coli. So if you're a mammal or a bird, doesn't matter if you're a squirrel or a chipmunk or an elephant or a, or a robin, uh, you have E. coli in your intestine. Uh, it's a really, really, really common uh, bacterial organism. Uh, and why do we know so much about it? It turns out it grows really well in a lab. And that's part of it, right? So it was discovered uh, you know, more than 100 years ago as something growing uh, really well and easy to, to study. And that's kind of why um, it's so famous, because we know lots about E. coli. Um, so it's, it's in your feces. And um, it's, um, you know, so it's associated with, uh, with fecal matter. And so I know everyone's looking at that number and saying, OK, about a, a million E. coli per gram of feces. And so how much feces do we produce? And there's the number, right? Every day, the world's population releases more than a billion trillion E. coli into the environment. And it's not all bad. Uh, there are much worse uh, organisms out there. Um, there are many strains of E. coli. So most strains fit into this category here, non-pathogenic. So most strains are in our gut and they're actually doing good things for us. They're making vitamin K, for example. They're uh, preventing uh, pathogens from taking up residency in your intestine. Um, and, and we're helping out E. coli too. We're, we're, we're giving them warmth and moisture and we're stuffing food in there. So it's, it's a good relationship. Unfortunately, there are some bad versions of E. coli. And I'm not gonna get into all the particulars here, but these are the ones you hear about in the news. The ones that cause traveler's diarrhea or the ones that uh, uh, are, are leading to uh, lettuce recalls and things like that. And these ones are usually found in fecal contamination of food or water. So that's what's happening with uh, some of these food recalls is, is uh, basically some sort of fecal matter. So some feces, um, you know, whether it's a uh, human poop or animal poop has somehow gotten into the lettuce, right? And uh, um, there's lots of ways how that can happen. It can cause different kinds of diseases. Usually we're talking about some sort of diarrhea. It could be uh, relatively mild or very severe. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of different strains that do it. And I'm not gonna get into all the particulars. There, there is kind of a third group of E. coli. Uh, the third group is, um, I'm calling them potentially pathogenic, meaning that they're usually good. They're good guys, but sometimes E. coli gets into the wrong body part. So if you've ever had a urinary tract infection, um, that's probably this one here, UPEC. UPEC stands for uropathogenic E. coli. So normally it's doing good stuff in your intestines, but uh, Sometimes, you know, our anatomy, right, um, we, you know, our, our, uh, our urethras are kind of close to our anuses, and, and uh, sometimes people get these infections, right, where it's E. coli getting up into the wrong body part and can cause uh, relatively mild or very severe infections. Sometimes people get E. coli in the blood and things like that, and, and that can be quite serious. But uh, um, that's kind of really what E. coli is. And you can see this last note is that some E. coli strains in fact, can't even live in the wild. They live in, in laboratories. And uh, so this is kind of the last point about E. coli is it's very useful for research. Uh, a lot of genetics and other kinds of research have been done in E. coli. Um, we use E. coli for uh, um, biotechnology type applications. This here slide shows an example of that, of uh, how we can make human insulin using E. coli. So before 1982, if you were diabetic and you needed insulin, um, we had to get it from animals. I think it was sheep. I'm not entirely sure. I'd have to look it up, but that, that means you'd have to kill a whole sheep just to get a little bit of insulin. Um, the sheep didn't like it, and uh, it was very expensive. And um, 
1982, they were like, well, why don't we just grow up insulin in E. coli? So how would you do that? So here, let me just tell you a little bit about how that's done. So what you can do is you can take the human DNA for insulin, right? So DNA is basically some information. It's a sequence of nucleotides. And what you can do is you can take that and you can stick it into a bacterial plasmid. So this, this here is a plasmid. Remember, plasmids are, uh, are basically little tiny chromosomes with uh, you know, just a couple of genes sometimes. So in this case, we put the gene for human insulin in there. And you can actually stick that plasmid back into E. coli. And uh, so we call this recombinant DNA or recombinant organism. And then what you do, you grow up E. coli. And then there we go. Um, e. coli produces the uh, protein for human insulin. And uh, we can collect that out of the fermentation tank. And, and now you have uh, human insulin. So E. coli, like I said, a very useful in the lab for all sorts of applications. And uh, it's something that uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, researching on for, for various reasons. Okay. Um, there are a few other things that we need to say about bacteria before we wrap up this unit. Uh, one is that bacteria form what we call the microbiome. So look at that word. Micro means small and biome means life. So the microbiome is all these organisms that live in us and on us. And they're living on your skin. The majority of them are living in your intestines, but they do live in, in all sorts of body systems, in your mouth, your ears, uh, your uh, genitals. Um, there's all sorts of organisms. And, and uh, we're starting to think of the microbiome as a human organ. Because without these organisms, mostly bacteria, Without these organisms, um, we would have issues. Uh, we would not have a properly developed immune system. Uh, the pH of the female vagina is, is dependent on, on certain species of organisms. Uh, so that has to do with uh, a woman's health and reproduction. Um, and you can see it goes on and on, this big list, right? Uh, some of them are protecting us from pathogens. Some of them are, are, uh, are dealing with our uh, digestion. Some of them probably affect our brain somehow. Uh, there's a little bit of research on that, which is kind of interesting. So mostly I just wanted to um, kind of define what microbiome is. And you'll probably hear that word again someday in your travels because you're starting to see a lot more research around it, trying to understand how these things impact our health. And it turns out it's, um, the answer is a lot. Um, and uh, we would like to figure out ways to encourage the good ones and discourage the bad ones. So. Maybe uh, you're somebody who takes probiotics, and that would be the reason why you might be doing so in order to encourage the good ones to live in you and on you rather than the bad ones. So let's, uh, let's, let's just talk a little bit about um, bacteria as pathogens. This is one of the big reasons why we study bacterial organisms. Many of them are pathogenic, meaning they cause human illness. We talked a little bit about anthrax already. We talked about anthrax being what uh, Robert Koch was studying, and it was killing uh, livestock. Humans can get, can get that cutaneous anthrax. That's uh, where the organism lives in the skin, and it leaves a pretty nasty uh, wound. This is necrotic tissue, so the cells are dying, and it leaves this kind of this black mark. Um, usually not serious when you get it in the skin, much more serious if you inhale it. So about 85% of our, our pathogens are bacterial in nature. I know we're talking a lot about viruses lately, but there are many, actually many more bacterial pathogens. Um, here's a little bit more in anthrax. Here's somebody who has it in the lungs, and this is where it gets very, very dangerous when you get it in the lungs. And uh, in fact, some livestock and wildlife uh, do die from it. They, uh, they're basically eating grass and they uh, get it from the soil and they inhale it up their noses into their lungs. And uh, this can be a, a lethal infection. So like I said, there are many, 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 many bacterial pathogens. Um, here's just a few off the top of my head. You may or may not have heard of some of these. Uh, a lot of them are causing very common infections such as skin infections or pneumonia, uh, strep throat. Uh, um, but there's, there's just a few on there. Like I said, kind of off the top of my head and then I just mentioned a few more. Um, not going to get into all of these. That would be a different class, but uh, we'll all have um, things about them that are very interesting. Uh, another term that you may have heard regarding pathogens is this one here, superbugs. Um, and you can see superbugs 
bugs meaning the germ. Um, these are organisms that are uh, resistant to uh, antibiotics, uh, and often they're resistant to many types of antibiotics. The, uh, the number one superbug is this one here, MRSA. So MRSA is methicillin resistant, and our old friend Staphylococcus aureus. So we talked about it as being an organism that can live on your skin. Uh, so it turns out that living on your skin is not a big deal. In fact, uh, probably about a third of us have it on our skin right now, uh, and it's not bothering us at all. But it's when it kind of gets invasive, it gets under the skin, it can cause skin infections. So we're talking about little blisters or impetigo or, or boils. Um, it's even worse if it gets into your blood or your lungs or something like that. So it can cause a lot of really serious infections. And uh, so this one here is kind of one of the most concerning superbugs. So when we talk about superbug, usually we're talking about this organism here. Um, so I kind of wanted to go back and, and talk about these structures for a minute and a little bit about antibiotics. And uh, that's kind of going to wrap up this topic. So if you take a look, here's a table of these structures that we talked about, right? And uh, we, we kind of already talked a little bit about their function. And... Uh, um, and what they're made of, right? And uh, so, so that part we've already talked about. So here's the thing, is that a lot of these structures are really important because they have clinical relevance, meaning that they're important to the pathogenesis of the organism. Um, and uh, so if you do go on and study some more medical stuff, or if you go on and, uh, and study bacteria, these, these things come up again and again as to why they're important for, in, let's say, invading human bodies. That's what a flagella uh, can be used for, for example. Um, some of these other things are important because they are actually uh, targets for our drugs. And the drugs that we use to treat bacterial infections are usually called antibiotics. So I wanna spend about five minutes talking about antibiotics uh, and then I'll wrap this, this unit up. So antibiotics um, are drugs and uh, usually the idea is we want a chemical that is gonna kill the bacteria and maybe and not kill the human, right? In fact, the best drugs are the ones that have no or minimal side effects. And so what we're trying to do in the case of pathogens is usually target something that is specific to the bacteria, but a human cell doesn't have. So the biggest area of antibiotics is this one here, is the first category here. So remember, a human cell does not have a cell wall. We don't have any peptidoglycan. So if you have a drug that affects peptidoglycan, then you're going to kill the bacteria and the human is going to be just fine. Uh, there are other targets. I'm not going to get into them, but uh, you know, DNA replication, you can see protein synthesis and so on. These are areas that are unique in the bacteria that are, that are either not found or it's different in the human cells, and they're all drug targets. So um, and I kind of have a slide here. You can see these are all different strategies for drugs. And the one uh, area I'm going to talk about is basically A, I want to talk about penicillins. So penicillins, you can see it says here, they inhibit peptidoglycan synthesis. So let's talk about how that might work. Here's my bacterial cell. And um, what it needs to do is when it's growing, it needs to make a new wall. Now, a wall is a rigid material. So think about it as like uh, if you're in your house and you're trying to... Uh, um, do some construction and you need to move a wall, you have to break it down or at least break down parts of it. And that's actually what a cell does. So what it does is basically makes gaps for new material and then it puts in the new material and then it divides and now you've got basically some more new cells. Uh, penicillin kind of gets in there and it's kind of like throwing a wrench in the machinery. And so the cell kind of crashes and dies. Um, that's a very, very basic level of it. Uh, and uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about it more if, you, if it's something you're interested in. Um, there's a whole bunch of penicillins out there. Uh, the chemical name for them is beta-lactams, but you can call them penicillins. You can see they all have in, in common this, um, this square uh, organic chemistry structure. Uh, that's called the beta-lactam ring. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them out there. I think there's at least a couple hundred now. Uh, penicillin G, penicillin V, ampicillin, methicillin. Um, they all have uh, differences in terms of which organisms they kill and, and how persistent they are in the body and all those kind of things. And, and uh, very interesting area of, of, uh, of study. Okay, um, so that's kind of it for topic 
four, no, topic five. Um, just have this last slide to show you. Um, this is actually a picture of my sister-in-law. Um, my sister-in-law is also a microbiologist. And uh, so um, for Halloween a few years ago, her and her husband, um, they went and they went to a dollar store and they bought a bunch of glow sticks. Uh, my brother-in-law made, a, made a, a Tyrannosaurus Rex and she made E. coli. So you can't see her face, but it's kind of like right here. She's uh, her head sticking out and her arms are sticking out here. <laughs> so and then legs are sticking out the back somewhere. I know that's kind of silly, but anyway, so if you're looking for an idea uh, for a Halloween costume um, for next year, there's an idea for you. So I think that's the last slide. Yes, it is. So that is it for topic five. Uh, I will see everybody in the lab tomorrow. Uh, we're doing lab three and, uh, or sorry, we're doing lab, or we did lab three. Sorry, we're doing lab four this week. So we are actually doing bacteria in the lab. Sorry for my confusion. I'll see you tomorrow.